Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Kim Knox, president of the League of Women Voters of San Diego. We're gearing up for a busy election season and we have many resources available to voters. Our Voters Edge website offers unbiased information on candidates from the top of the ticket down to the local level. You can view candidate biographies, top priorities, answers to questions, photos, policy videos, endorsements, and detailed information about who funds the campaigns. Voters Edge also makes it easy to understand state and local measures. You just type in your home address on the website to review all of the items on your ballot. We'll put that link in the chat. We have two upcoming events related to the election, which will be held in person. On September 29 at 1 p.m., we'll meet at the Mission Valley Library to advocate for City of San Diego Measure B. Voters will be asked to approve an amendment so that all city residents receive comparable trash, recycling, and other solid waste management services by allowing the city to charge a hauling fee and provide additional services such as weekly recycling, bulky item pickup, and curbside container replacement and delivery at no extra charge. On October 3rd at 6 p.m. at the Mission Hills Hillcrest Knox Library, we'll present a nonpartisan an analysis of the five local measures and seven state propositions. You can register for these events as well as upcoming candidate forums on our website. The League is an all volunteer organization and we greatly appreciate the donations made during registration for this event. For anyone who would like to donate this evening, there will be a link in the chat. Now on to tonight's topic. The League recommends voting yes on Proposition 1, which will amend the California Constitution to enshrine the fundamental right to choose an abortion, use or refuse birth control, and make individual decisions on reproductive health. The League believes these rights are consistent with existing state laws and our state constitutional rights to privacy and equal protection. Access to affordable, comprehensive reproductive health care, including abortion, allows people to plan their lives, protect their health, and achieve their dreams. Prop 1 protects access to the care that will give individuals and families the freedom to make these choices. Um, the president of the League of Women Voters of California, Carol Moon Goldberg, has signed the ballot argument. The campaign website is yesonone.ca.com, and that will be in the chat as well. I'd also like to mention that this week, California launched a publicly funded website to promote the state's abortion services, listing clinics, linking to financial help for travel and lodging, and letting teenagers in other states know that they don't need their parents' permission to get an abortion in California. The website is part of Governor Newsom's pledge to make California a sanctuary for women seeking abortions now that US, the US Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade. Check the chat for the link. It is abortion.ca.gov. The co-sponsors of this event, Planned Parenthood Action Fund of the Pacific Southwest and Women's March San Diego, both support Prop 1 as well. Now I'd like to introduce Molly Turbovich Reidenauer of Women's March San Diego. Thank you, Kim, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in this very important conversation. Just wanted to Thank everyone involved tonight and also just on the behalf of the Board of Women's March San Diego, we stand in solidarity with all the women on this call and all of you in the audience tonight. So thank you and we're happy to sponsor this event. Thank you, Molly. I'm Jane Andrews. I am the events chair of the League of Women Voters of San Diego. The decision on June 24th by the US Supreme Court on the Dobbs versus Jackson Health Center was a shock to so many people across the country. However, it has led to some important mobilization of action in support of reproductive freedom. We are pleased to have two experts on this important topic, two local experts, and it is my pleasure to introduce them. After each one has spoken, about 20 minutes each, we will have a question and answer period. Please put your questions in the Q&A section which uh, there should be an icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And President Kim Knox and I will moderate the questions. Our first speaker is Marjorie Cohn. Marjorie is a formal, former criminal defense attorney, professor emerita at Thomas Jefferson School of Law from 1991 to 2016, and also former president of the National Lawyers Guild. 
She is on the advisory board of the American Constitution Society in San Diego. And she is also a legal and political analyst who writes a regular column for Truth Out, a nonprofit news organization dedicated to ind independent reporting and commentary on a wide variety of social justice topics. Recently, she has been writing and speaking on national radio on the topic of reproductive freedom. She will give us a legal view of the background and the need for a state constitutional amendment. Then we have Lori Keim, who is the Vice President for Business Development of Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. She is a reproductive health care executive and social justice advocate with 20 plus years of experience operating 19 health centers and planning future program and service expansions. She develops facility growth strategies and creates opportunities for alternate delivery models. And she enjoys bridging new business partnerships and community connections with a focus on health equity and patient experience. She will focus on what Planned Parenthood has been experiencing, especially following the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision this past June. Marjorie, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you to the League for inviting me to speak on this really, really important issue. Um, for the first time in the history of this country, the U.S. Supreme Court has retracted a fundamental constitutional right, the right to abortion. Samuel Alito wrote the majority decision on behalf of himself, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And that five-person majority said that procuring an abortion is not a fundamental constitutional right because such a right has no basis in the Constitution's text or in our nation's history. In 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court held that abortion was a fundamental right for women's life and future. And it said that states could not ban abortion until after viability. In other words, when a fetus could live outside the womb, generally about 23 weeks of pregnancy. 19 years later, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the central holding of Roe v. Wade in Planned Parenthood versus Casey and said that states could only place restrictions on abortions if they did not impose an undue burden on the right to a pre-viability abortion. Now, there are two different kinds of rights in the Constitution or implied in the Constitution. There are enumerated rights, which are specifically named in the Constitution, such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to bear arms, um, the right to a fair trial, etc. And then there are what we call unenumerated rights, because the Ninth Amendment says that even if rights are not enumerated, that does not mean that they don't exist. Um, unenumerated rights, which are well settled, are the right to travel, the right to privacy, and the right to abortion. In both Roe and Casey, the Supreme Court grounded the right to abortion in the Due Process Clause, in the Liberty section of the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, which says that states shall not deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the court in Roe relied on several of its precedents, saying that the right of personal liberty prohibits the government from interfering with personal decisions about contraception, marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and the education of children. Well, the majority in Dobbs, of course, led by Alito, said that the Constitution contains no specific reference to abortion and no constitutional provision implicitly protects it. And in order to be protected by the Due Process Clause, a right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. 
But according to the majority in Dobbs, there is no liberty interest because the law didn't protect the right to abortion in the 19th century. The majority said that Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong, but anticipating that people would think that this paves the way for the Supreme Court to take away other rights, other reproductive rights, Alito wrote for the majority, the court emphasizes that this decision concerns the constitutional right to abortion and no other right. Nothing in this opinion shall be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. But the dissenters were not convinced. Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena, and Elena Kagan, who wrote a collective dissent, they said that the right to abortion enshrined in Roe is part of the same constitutional fabric as the rights to contraception and same-sex marriage and intimacy. And then they wrote, either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy or additional constitutional rights are under threat. It is one or the other. Now, Clarence Thomas didn't pull any punches in his concurrence. He said that the court should reconsider other precedents based on substantive due process such as the right to contraception, the right to same-sex sexual conduct, and the right to same-sex marriage. Now, let's look at the state of abortion rights in California, because basically what Dobbs did was to punt the issue of abortion to the states. And so we see now that states, many states are jumping on the bandwagon and restricting or outlawing abortion altogether. And I'll come to that in a minute. But in California, in 1969, the California Supreme Court ruled that women have the constitutional rights to life and to choose whether to bear children. And the fundamental right of the woman to choose whether to bear children is comes from a right of privacy or liberty in matters related to marriage, family, and sex. So that was the California Supreme Court. Then in 1972, the California voters passed Proposition 11, which made privacy, which put privacy into the Constitution of California. So now Article 1 of the California Constitution protects the right to privacy. Then in 18, excuse me, 1981, the California Supreme Court cited that right to privacy that Proposition 11 had created and said that a woman's right of procreative choice is an aspect of the right to privacy under the explicit privacy protection in the California Constitution. And that protection is at least as broad as the, the protection of abortion in Roe v. Wade. Um, and they said that the state's interest in protecting a non-viable fetus, that means before viability, is subordinate to the woman's right to privacy. And finally, in 2002, the California State Legislature passed the Reproductive Privacy Act, which declares that women have a fundamental right to choose to bear a child or to choose to obtain an abortion. Now, the California Supreme Court is very progressive. And the California Supreme Court has said that the right to privacy, which is already in the California Constitution, protects the right to, to uh, abortion. But what happens if in the future, we have a not so progressive California Supreme Court? And this is kind of a microcosm of what we saw in, this, in the US Supreme Court. In order to enshrine the right to abortion in the California Constitution and not require a future California Supreme Court to interpret the right to privacy in the California Constitution as including abortion, Proposition 1 specifically adds the right to abortion as a constitutional right and the right to contraception, by the way. And it says briefly, the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions. 
that includes the fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraception. This section is intended to further the constitutional right to privacy as guaranteed by section one of the California Constitution and the constitutional right not to be denied equal protection as guaranteed by section seven of the California Constitution. So if Proposition 1 passes in November, California would be one of the first states, if not the first state, to create an explicit constitutional right to abortion and contraception. In June, on June 27th of this year, Governor Newsom officially declared California a reproductive rights sanctuary in so many words. And just briefly, uh, he wrote in executive order N-12-22, the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs overturned half a century of settled precedent, stripped away the constitutional right to reproductive freedom and jeopardized safe access to reproductive health care. Reproductive freedom and access is foundational to personal autonomy, dignity, and ability to participate fully in economic, social, and civil life. Over half the states in this country have an outright ban or severely restrict access to abortion, and in many states, patients, doctors, and other healthcare providers face criminal prosecution for receiving or providing health abortion health care. Anti-abortion states are already considering ways to track and monitor potential, potentially pregnant women and providers, and anti-abortion laws place women in jeopardy of being wrongly prosecuted for miscarrying a child uh, because miscarriage can be medically indistinguishable from having an abortion. Anti-abortion states are considering bans on contraception, including IUDs, morning after pills, and certain kinds of fertility treatment, and anti-abortion states are now considering laws outside their own territorial border to criminalize and extend civil liability to patients who travel to other states where abortion health care is legal. So what Governor Newsom ordered is that all agencies and departments in California are prohibited from providing any information, including patient medical records, billing information, et cetera, in furtherance of any inquiry or investigation for providing, securing, or receiving reproductive, reproductive health care services or any form of, of assistance or support given to any person re, re, related to reproductive health care. And reproductive health care in his executive order is defined as all medical, surgical, counseling, or referral services relating to the human reproductive system, including but not limited to pregnancy, contraception, or the termination of a pregnancy. So finally, uh, Governor Newsom's order says, my office shall decline any request from any other state to issue a warrant for the arrest or surrender of any person charged with a criminal violation of law where it involves reproductive health care services. Now, let's look at what some of the other states are doing. Um, as of January 2022, four states had constitutional amendments declaring that their constitutions do not protect a right to abortion. Tennessee, Alabama, West Virginia, and Louisiana. Arkansas has a constitutional amendment that says it is the policy of Arkansas to protect the life of every unborn child from conception until birth, to the extent permitted by the federal constitution. But in 1986, in Massachusetts and Florida in 2012, these constitutional amendments were defeated. Likewise, on August 2nd of this year, in Kansas, there was a vote to amend the Kansas constitution 
to say that nothing in the state constitution creates a right to abortion or requires government funding of abortion, and that amendment went down to defeat. Good for Kansas. Now, currently on the ballot for November 8th in California and Michigan and Vermont are uh, initiatives that would add, that would amend the constitutions of those states to protect the right to abortion. As we said, California would amend the California constitution saying that California could not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, including the decision to have an abortion or use contraceptives. In Michigan, it would amend the Michigan constitution to provide a state constitutional right to reproductive freedom, which is defined to include abortion, contraception, and other matters related to pregnancy. And in Vermont, it would amend the Vermont constitution to provide a state constitutional right to personal reproductive autonomy. There are two states that have um, amendments on their on their ballot that would do just the opposite. In Kentucky, there is a measure to amend the Kentucky Constitution to say that nothing in the state constitution creates a right to abortion or requires government funding of abortion. That's Kentucky. And Montana would provide in state law that infants born alive at any stage of development are legal persons and um, require medical care to infants born alive after an induced labor, C-section, attempted abortion, or other method. Um, since, and I just want to conclude my remarks by saying that since the Dobbs decision came down from the Supreme Court, uh, we are still in shock from that, but there has been a tremendous backlash. Women have been registering to vote in record numbers. This looks like it's shaping up to be a central issue in the election and may well mean the difference between the Democrats retaining control of the Senate and losing the Senate and maybe the same in the House, although it looks uh, more dismal in terms of retaining the House in Democratic hands. Um, Lindsey Graham, I think it was yesterday, introduced um, a bill that would ban abortion after 15 weeks, but it would not prevent other states from banning abortion before 15 weeks. Um, it has exceptions for rape, incest, and saving the life of the mother. But Mitch McConnell uh, says that Lindsey Graham is going off by himself and that the uh, the Republican Party, the Republican caucus, really uh, does not go along with Lindsey Graham's um, bill, but rather would leave the whole decision up to the states, states' rights. So um, it's a very fluid situation. It's very volatile, but I think that we can safely say that uh, the Dobbs case completely changed the national conversation and uh, really struck a dagger into the heart of reproductive rights for all people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Um, Lori, over to you. Excellent, thank you so much. And that was fantastic. Thank, thanks, Marjorie, for that wonderful, really level setting. There's a lot to cover there in those 20 minutes. And uh, volatile is is a great word for how things are going, I think, right now. And um, really having a struck a chord throughout, throughout our nation. So tonight I will be speaking um, a little bit more from the Planned Parenthood's sort of on the ground perspective around what um, this decision has really, um, how it's shaping up for, for us here in California, for our health centers, for our staff that work at our organization, as well as um, other folks who are providing abortion care in California and also our colleagues across the country. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about um, what's happening on the ground, um, really the impact of that decision, how, again, it's playing out in some of our other states that might not look quite like California, um, what is looking like and how that impacts our abortion providers and our health center staff, 
And then finally, really how you can make an impact um, or a difference in this moment too. So we'll definitely leave you with um, some call to action. To start though, I wanted just to um, tell you a little bit about the Planned Parenthood organization, uh, just as a quick 30 second level set for those of you who may not be as familiar, we are a, an affiliated organization. So we have a national office who is based in New York City in Washington DC, two offices. And there are about 50 or so affiliates across the country that are independently run, um, but we are associated with, with the national office. We run under the same medical protocols. Um, we have accreditation visits from our national office every three to four years. And so are, are held to many um, indicators and standards across the board. So the goal is if you go into one Planned Parenthood in say Kentucky, it should look and feel like a Planned Parenthood in San Diego. So here locally within the state of California, there are seven affiliates. So we're split into sort of seven, seven, seven different regions. Our affiliate Pacific Southwest, we have 19 health centers. We are located in San Diego, Riverside County and Imperial County. We have a budget uh, currently at about $110 million. About 10, 12 years ago, we were probably sitting at around 60. So have nearly doubled the size just over the past 10 years or so, um, just with a tremendous growth opportunity um, and, and just really the supporters that we have in our region to make that happen. So, and when you look at the, the big landscape um, in terms of all abortions in the country, the state of California provides about 15% or so of total abortions within the country. There's some varied stats on that depending on the year um, that you could find. And within the Planned Parenthood families so of all the Planned Parenthood clinics throughout the country, the state of California's Planned Parenthood health centers provides up to 20% of all abortions within the country. So, you know, we were um, really preparing, for, unfortunately, preparing for this moment for quite some time and really got that wake up call this past September with an SB8 with Texas. So, um, in terms of what it's been looking like over the past um, two months or so, I'll start with just a little bit of more background. And some of this will be um, kind of reflecting of a little bit of what Marjorie said as well. But when Roe v. Wade was dismantled by the decision, in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, it really opened the door for states across the country to severely restrict or outright ban abortion. And as Marjorie said, already we've seen lawmakers in many states, and we're estimating it's anywhere from the 20s to 23s or so, the numbers that we're tracking right now have either severely limited or banned abortion rights outright. Abortion bans have always been disproportionately harming Black, Latinx, indigenous, and other people of color, immigrants, and people with low incomes, and are a product of the systematic barriers to care that these communities continue to face. And patients with the means to travel are being forced to flee their state to access basic critical care, and those that cannot travel or afford to travel for health care are facing difficult barriers to getting to the care they need. And we're seeing this, unfortunately, every day. So at the Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, we saw a significant rise in, in the number of out-of-state patients, particularly from Arizona, seeking abortion care at our health centers immediately following the Dobbs announcement. So what does that look like for us in terms of really our volume? To give you a sense. So the day of the decision, June 24th, and following the probably next four to five weeks after that, we had about a 22% increase in total abortion visits, um, which as you can imagine, um, when your organization is only has about 5% of our total patient visits are abortions. When, when that gets ramped up to an increase of 22% um, in, in, your, in your operation, how much that really can also impact the other care that we're providing, um, especially to folks in California or those that are already trying to access care within our regions. So the one thing I'm really proud to say is because we were anticipating some of this, and we've had a lot of planning on the grounds leading up to this, within those first few days, we were able to get patients in to any of our most any of our 19 health centers within same or next day access. That meant we had two to three providers every day providing care in our centers. 
we were opening Sundays at one of our locations. We looked at some evening hours. And so there was just an all out commitment from our health center staff, from our administration staff, um, some other great leadership from the California um, State Advocacy Office to really ensure we can make that happen. In terms of the types of abortion, um, I know some people might be interested um, in that piece as well. About 60 to 70% of our patients are seeking the medication abortion pill. So with uh, many folks want to do that um, for some flexibility, there might be some other personal reasons they want to be able to complete the procedure um, with a partner or in the privacy of their home. And um, we currently provide a, a medication abortion procedures up to 11 weeks gestation. So that has recently been expanded. Over the years, it had been at nine up to 10, and now we are performing that at 11 weeks, which is fantastic for another um, piece of our access expansion. And the remaining folks um, who are seeking care are looking to be able to complete an in-clinic abortion or what some people call a surgical abortion um, at our centers. And we provide that care at four of our locations throughout our service regions. In terms of what we've seen from out-of-state patients, leading up to the decision day, uh, the Dobbs decision, on in total, about 3% of all of our patients seeking abortion care were coming from out-of-state. So not a, not a big amount, but still a, a pretty good um, amount when we're talking about thousands and thousands of visits a year. Immediately following the Dobbs decision, 22% of our abortion patients that first month were coming and driving from Arizona. So 22% of folks that we were seeing in our centers uh, were from Arizona and a total of 25% were out of state patients. So including Arizona, but we also have been seeing several folks from Texas, Nevada, Mexico, um, and some from other, other regional areas as well. And I think one of the other interesting pieces I wanted to um, just call your attention to is that when we were looking at some of our visit statistics in, in July and comparing them to the previous July, we wanted to sort of get an idea of what that um, impact was looking like. What we found is that we've had a 49% in abortion visits comparing last July 2021 to this July 2022. So we definitely had been seeing a slight uptick in folks seeking abortion care with us leading up to Dobbs, but nothing like we saw immediately afterwards. So we've definitely been preparing for this moment. Again, um, our staff has been incredibly committed and wanting to just step into the moment um, and really be there for the folks who, who don't have the care in their, in their home states. So you can also imagine that many of these out-of-state patients are also facing barriers around travel housing, covering the cost of the procedure, which we know Governor Newsom and his office is doing a fantastic job to help address and support organizations like us and patients out there to, to provide some funds towards. Internally, um, we have significantly had to have grown our abortion navigation program, um, which really looks like several folks every day who are 100% dedicated to ensuring we do support people who are coming from out of state and finding whatever it is that they need to ensure they can safely get to our centers, whether that be providing lift services, um, taxi money, gas cards. Um, we're looking at, so we provide uh, food vouchers for folks while they are here and if they are food insecure um, to be able to do that. And we also uh, can book folks hotels um, and ensure that they have, they are, they're staying in safe places when they are here with us. Um, other practical support funding organizations too, I wanted to lift up here tonight was ACTS and is Access Reproductive Justice. So they are the largest um, abortion support fund in the state of California who not only supports patients living in California, but anyone who lives outside California wanting to seek care within our state. And they also have a deep, deep network of volunteers who actually can help provide um, lodging in their own homes. Once they've been vetted, they can help provide uh, rides to, to appointments for patients as needed. Um, they also have uh, support funds for the procedure. And so they've been a great partner. We've really closely collaborated with them um, it's, as well as other Planned Parenthoods throughout the state during this really critical time. On the day of the Dobbs decision, when our patient navigators logged into their telephones at 8 a.m. that morning, they already had a queue of 10 people waiting 
to talk to them, to book their appointment, to figure out how in the heck they were going to get to our health centers. So just that that morning, um, when we heard that decision, I think it was about 7 a.m. here Pacific time or so, um, our team was there and ready and started immediately making um, the care arrangements and the appointments needed. So our, it's been a fantastic um, kind of process to really watch that team grow um, and the stories that they're able to share um, with our donors and with other folks and just the gratitude that so many patients have for, for a team of people being there and, and sometimes the hardest moments that folks are facing. So really proud of, of that work there. So just shifting for a moment to what else we are seeing in other states, you know, since we are an affiliated organization, we have very close relationships with or, with all of our Planned Parenthood organizations across the country. So states that border states where bans are now in place, they're also seeing huge increases. The first that come to mind are Illinois, um, Colorado. Those are some of the kind of frequently communicated states that we are talking with and learning from as they are being significantly impacted by, by nearby states that are no longer providing or limiting abortion care. Um, lawmakers in many states have already enacted restrictions, as we know, or outright bans. And particularly in Arizona, because we are, you know, we share that border line, um, we're really waiting and waiting to see where and how um, that state will continue to be impacted. For the first several weeks following Dobbs, most if not all the providers immediately stopped providing care. Many have actually reinstated care over the past several weeks. And so we've actually started seeing a bit of an off shift of some demand here. Um, but on September 20th, um, I believe uh, there is a judge, and I will just say this broadly because I don't have all the information, but it sounds like there will be some sort of ruling or de decision coming out about the pre-row ban that was on the books. And so it sounds like they'll get more information um, or maybe some guidance around how some of the organizations will choose to proceed with providing abortion care there. So th that information is constantly shifting. And in the state of Texas, because we know that is the second uh, most common state we are seeing folks from, um, we've been in close monitoring and communication with the folks there in that state um, and really being able to, to step in and see patients from there. Our legal teams locally at the state level and in our national office have been closely collaborating and are completely committed to monitoring this landscape. The only certainty we have is that the, there will continue to be uncertainty and more and more changes to come. So in terms of the abortion provider impacts, I wanna just talk a little bit about um, how, our, how our teams are doing and that's sort of how the, um, the overall climate is feeling for folks. So even before the Supreme Court handed down this decision, abortion was already a right and name only for many across our country. Barriers to accessing healthcare, including abortion, have always existed a lack of insurance, the cost of childcare, taking time off for work, transportation and lodging associated with traveling hundreds or even thousands of miles. So our affiliate and abortion providers across this country have been, pre pre been preparing for this moment to try and increase the access in the states where abortion can still be accessed. So as you all know, abortion is still safe and legal in California, and we have these protections in place to ensure all people can get the care that they need here no matter where they may be traveling from. And, and as you can imagine, this has not been easy, often on our providers. They're wondering about the risks to their own license. Um, they're worrying about their families, um, if they were to be prosecuted for any reason. Um, they worry about our patients who are coming from other states and are traveling back to potentially a banned state following the procedure and if there would to be a complication at that point. So it's been it's been a heavy time. There's been lots of questions. Um, we've had many different office hours with our legal counsel, our medical director, really um, spending time with many of our staff talking through a lot of what this means. And, and really the commitment we have as an organization to really step in and protect our staff, ensure our staff and our patients have all the information they need um, as transparently as possible. So that's really been our commitment um, to our teams. Also, many providers uh, have put some systems into place in the meantime to help better protect both providers and patients in this uncertain moment. So for instance, we now, our affiliate has now, we now have all of our patients who are opting for a medication abortion. We have them sign an attestation, um, which essentially states that they agree to stay in the state of California 
until they complete taking all of their medication. And that we advise that all of those patients also follow up with their provider in California for a visit once their abortion is complete. Um, and I think once we put that attestation into place, uh, really from experience of our providers and from the patients, there was a lot more clarity, I think, in terms of what we were asking and what we were expecting um, of, our, um, of our staff and of our patients. And so um, I know that's been, it sounds like it's been appreciated from, from folks on the ground, um, as well as just some more clarity from patients on, on what they can and should expect when they schedule an appointment with us. So in addition, the California Future of Abortion Council is making strides to improve access to abortion in California, both for residents and those seeking services from out of state. Um, so they are working hard, as we heard from Marjorie, to pass this legislation and budget requests. Um, I believe there's now been $125 million allocated towards these initiatives that the Future of Abortion Council has put forward. Um, and again, in November, we're going to have this opportunity to support Prop 1, which will embed the right to abortion and contraception into our state constitution. So that is all around the corner. Um, and, you know, finally, at Planned Parenthood, we know that banning abortion does not take away people's need to access abortion care. Patients who need access to abortion should not face the shame and overwhelming hurdles that have come from this decision. So we are doing everything we can to help patients to get abortion care safely. So if you are wondering if there's anything that you can do to help, there is, there's a few things. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how to get engaged or how to donate to any variety of uh, abortion funds, either at the local, within our affiliate, at the state level or at the national level, you can visit voteforchoice.org slash take action. And we can pop that into the chat in a moment here. And you can find all that information um, on how to support our local travel fund, our local procedural fund for patients who may need that support, um, as well as the information for Access Reproductive Justice, who is supporting folks all across the state of California for those same services, um, as well as the National Network of Abortion Funds, which is uh, supporting 80 different abortion funds across the country. So if you're interested in a particular fund in a certain state, definitely check that spot out as well. And I think one of the other important things that folks don't often think about is the power of either telling your abortion story or listening to other abortion storytellers. It's, it's incredibly important um, and it really helps uh, continue to destigmatize abortion. Um, I think that is one of the reasons why we are here today is because we, abortion is just not as um, normalized really as, as it could and should be. Nor abortion care, abortion is healthcare. And I think the more that we can do to tell stories and really support folks who aren't able to um, provide sets of specific supports from themselves could really go a long way. So I will wrap my comments um, at this point and we'll turn it back to Jane and Kim. All right, well, thank you, Lori and Marjorie for your presentations. As I said earlier, the League of Women Voters of California recommends a yes vote on Proposition 1 and the campaign website is yesononeca.com. Please submit your questions by using the Q&A button in Zoom. And Jane's going to start us off with the first question. Okay, I, I just, I, I'm feeling a little emotional after both of these talks, I have to say. I think um, it's the work that both of you have been doing, but I, I have to salute Planned Parenthood in particular to be prepared to respond is just so heroic. And um, I just have to appreciate that. Um, I wanted to start out with a question about harassment. Um, you know, I think there's been such a long history of harassment of people at clinics and providers. And I was wondering if in, well, in California in particular, if you have been finding there has been any increased harassment of people um, that you've heard of. And I think a sort of second question, and this is really for everyone, Kim, too, is who are, who in California are the major opponents to Prop 1? Do we know? 
So I, yeah, Lori, I think it's for you to start if, if you don't mind. Sure. So in terms of harassment, um, <laughs> So I, and maybe Marjorie is able to speak a little bit more to this, and I would, you know, wish our legal counsel was here. She has very close uh, relationships with law enforcement in all of our different regions. And I do believe there is, there are, there is a, there are some or a state law within California that does um, protect uh, certain uh, distances where folks aren't able to, uh, say, block clinic doors, driveways, openings. Um, so there are definitely some California legal protections built in for abortion providers. And I, I will say within our region, there are, we do experience uh, protesters, uh, fortunately not, um, not much violence, if any violence at all recently. Um, and I think it's, it's more of a, a distraction for I think our patients um, and frustrating for our staff when that does occur. Um, but we have very in-depth, um, we have a large, first of all, large security team um, internally and we do, we run all kinds of different um, kind of safety security drills. Folks are really trained on how to manage uh, protesters and how to support patients in these moments um, and to not engage. So we have a very deep learning and support with our teams. And um, oftentimes we have on-site security at, at our surgical abortion locations as well. So I would say there are different other areas within the state of California and absolutely across uh, the country. I used to live in Ohio and work at Planned Parenthood in Ohio, and that's a very different environment and culture in terms of feeling of safety and violence and, and harassment in, in different states. So leave that there. Okay. Thank and you. And also, I can add that the ballot argument against it was signed by a woman who's a gynecologist, an assembly member, and the president of the International Faith-Based Coalition. Hmm. It's also opposed by the California Catholic Conference. Thank you. Um, someone also noted that they're having trouble copying and pasting what's in the chat. And I know we've put a lot in there. So I wanted to let everyone know that we can send a follow-up email with all of the links that have been put in the chat tonight. So you can look for that tomorrow morning. Um, we did have a question submitted, um, noting that it's becoming more common to use the phrase people who are pregnant rather than pregnant women. And um, this person is wondering if Prop 1 should use that term as well. Would I mean, is that something that could be in the California Constitution? Say, so something like people who may want an abortion? In the language of Prop 1, it says, the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom, which includes their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraception. I think we've got it covered. I'm proud to say. And yes, I also, so I right. also want to say that I feel very grateful to live in California because um, there is no state that is more progressive on this issue uh, than California. And uh, we're, we're lucky to be here, quite frankly. Good to know. Thank you. So I have another question. Uh, about the sort of the pharmaceutical approach to abortion and what some of the issues are that are occurring about sending about telehealth and uh, sending medications across state lines. This is for Lori. So I can speak for, um, I guess, just our affiliate in California. And again, I'm not a legal uh, person um, or involved in the medical, I'm more in the business development, ensuring we have access. Um, there are there are definitely um, organizations and Planned Parenthood within the state of California that are providing medication abortion via telehealth, and they are and the requirement is to mail those medications to a residence within the state of California, or to a location to an address within the state of California. So at this time, um, 
you know, we are, we would not be able to have provided telehealth service for a person who is in Tucson, who is seeking medication abortion, and then for us to mail pills to that person um, across the state line. Um, now, there are a lot of, and I'm sure folks have um, noticed a lot of either new or more um, visible uh, independent organizations that are providing medication abortion online, um, not associated with Planned Parenthood um, at all, but it's lots of other options that um, folks are able to and readily find online to, to obtain medication abortion. Mm -hmm. And those are those are situations where it could be sent across state lines. Or you may not know the answer to that, but I cannot speak to that. I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we have covered a lot of ground here. And um, you know, you both have really given us a very full discussion. Um, Marjorie, do you have any particular call to action for the election yourself? Oh, um, I mean, for the, about the proposition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the important thing and other people who have been on the ground organizing around prop one are probably in, in a much better position to, to speak to this, but I think the most important thing is getting the word out to people that it's on the ballot, um, because that in and of itself will bring people to the polls if they were not otherwise going to go to the polls. Um, it's such a critical issue to so many people. So I think that, uh, I mean, I've read about it and heard about it, but it's not as visible and, uh, you know, ubiquitous as as I would hope, the whole notion that it's that it's on the ballot, and so I think that if there's anything that could be done for improvement, it's getting the word out more broadly. Yes, I, I was reviewing the the some of the counter arg arguments uh, that are on uh, Voters Edge, our our website. And one of them is, well, California's really got it covered. You know, we don't need this extra piece. But I think you explained so very well why this would make it a much more permanent part of the state. And, and given what we're experiencing with uh, the national U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so that seems to be a key point that people's, it, you know, it does seem like California has a lot of laws already. Um, I, another counter argument that I heard was, or I read, was I think the more typical one of, well, this is just going to mean all kinds of late stage abortions and it's going to cost the state, you know, millions of dollars. And I, I don't see that as being as strong an argument, uh, kind of one we've heard before and are, are hearing. So I think you're right about getting people out, making sure people fill in those ballots and send them in. And, uh, you know, the league is very involved in the next month in doing these ballot measure pro and cons um, and really working on that. So, yeah. So let's see. I think we have another question, which is, would, this is from Jeannie Brown, would having a, con a federal constitutional amendment regarding government interfering with personal freedom be easier to pass since it would be hard to oppose that. So it's it would be a, an amendment of, about government interfering with personal freedom. I suppose that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Personal freedom as opposed to, uh, you know, the right to choose, the right to privacy. Yeah, you, pers you know? yeah, personal freedom could be, you know, personal freedom to carry a gun anywhere you want, mm. uh, to uh, invade the Capitol anytime you want. Uh, you know, I think there's some, it's a slippery slope, personal freedom. And of course, it, if the Constitution were amended, in that way, and it's very, very difficult to get uh, the federal constitution amended. 
um, it would be up to individual courts and judges to interpret what personal freedom means. And I think it would become very political. Um, so I'm just not sure uh, that, that that would really be feasible or even desirable. Could you just, just as a little follow-up to that, could you remind us of what it would take to get a constitutional amendment? Doesn't it have to be passed in every state in addition to the, or in a majority of states in addition? I think it's two thirds. I think it's two thirds okay. of states, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, never say never, you know, it, we might be able to do it. Right. We do have another question. Um, do you believe that the passing of Prop 1 would lead to advocates at other states pushing for something similar to be put on the ballots there? Well, there are similar propositions on the ballots in Michigan and Vermont. Um, and there was an opposite uh, initiative on Kansas's ballot, which was uh, went down to defeat. So I, I think I think we'll see more and more of this as time goes on, and uh, and we have more elections. They're going to be very creative ways. They're going to be very aggressive ways to try to um, protect the right to choose. And uh, also, there are going to be. I mean, half the states now, more than half the states, have uh, either severe restrictions or outright bans on abortion. Um, and uh, so, you know, they're jumping on the bandwagon. And then, of course, um, these particular laws will be interpreted by judges in those states. Keep in mind that Donald Trump has appointed a tremendous number of judges to the federal bench, not the state bench, not, but the, the federal courts, the district courts, the circuit courts of appeals and, and the Supreme Court. And, of course, he's already reaping dividends from that because, uh, you know, his latest judge that he appointed and chose is trying to shield him from uh, you know, stealing those documents. But um, so I, I think it will depend upon um, how judges interpret them. But I think that this is a, this again, it's, it's volatile, it's fluid, it's not gonna end with this election. Um, and people are going to get abortions by hook or crook. Unfortunately, this is not gonna stop. I'm not, I don't mean to preface it by saying unfortunately, but uh, people are not going to stop getting abortions. It's just going to mean fewer safe abortions. That's what overturning Roe v. Wade means. It doesn't mean that people will not have abortions. It just means it will be harder to access safe abortions, which is of course the tragedy of the situation. We've learned so much, Marjorie and Laurie. I want to thank you again for participating this evening. Yeah, it's been a terrific uh, overview and insights on so many aspects of both your work. So very much appreciate it.